Good afternoon, everyone. This is Joe Rodriguez. I'm the California State Long-Term Care Ombudsman here at the California Department of Aging. And welcome to our web webinar this afternoon on new elder and dependent adult abuse reporting requirements under Assembly Bill 40. We have with us today Lisa Coleman, who is the Executive Director of the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. And in place of Heather Harrison, Sally Michael, the President of the California Assisted Living Association. I'd like to thank um, CALA for their efforts to help get the word out about AB40 and for publicizing this webinar to its members. I'd also like to thank Leading Age California and the Community Residential Care Association of California for helping to get the word out to their members as well. This afternoon, we'll be talking about the changes in mandated reporting here in California and we'll give you a little bit of background about why the changes were necessary and why they took place and how the changes are going to affect the way you as mandated reporters report suspected or alleged um, physical and other types of abuse occurring in your facilities. Um, this afternoon I'm pleased to have Lisa Coleman and Heather Harrison from um, the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association and the California Assisted Living Association joining us on the webinar to help us share with you how AB40 is going to change the way reporting is made here in California. We will be recording this webinar and the webinar, uh, the webinar recording will be posted on CALA's website and the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association website along with the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation and the mandated reporter flowchart. We did send out yesterday the slides and the mandated reporter flowchart to the list of registered attendees for this webinar. If you didn't receive those yesterday, you'll be able to, again, download those from both the CALA and CALCOA websites. So why was this bill introduced? Previously, um, elder and dependent adult abuse that occurred in long-term care facilities was reported to either the local long-term care ombudsman program or the local law enforcement agency in your community. As established in the Older Americans Act, ombudsmen must have the consent of the resident or the resident's legal representative to disclose that individual's identity. That confidentiality provision in the Act applies to any kind of disclosure, even disclosure of an individual's name who's noted on a SOC 341 form. And so in our work as ombudsmen, um, we often, oftentimes uh, had difficulty in cross-reporting um, cases of known or suspected abuse to law enforcement or to the licensing agencies either because the resident did not want us to disclose that information or the resident couldn't disclose couldn't give us consent to disclose that that information whether because of capacity dementia um, or some other reason sometimes residents um, have no surrogate decision maker, have no legal representative, no one is available to give us consent. Sometimes residents simply do not want this information shared even with law enforcement or um, uh, uh, the, the, the licensing agency. In most other states, it should be noted, um, reports of abuse and neglect are addressed by either um, local law enforcement or adult protective services or the licensing agency. But California is one of six states that gives this responsibility to the local long-term care ombudsman program. We know from our data that in almost three quarters of all the reports that we have, um, we have been unable to obtain consent from residents. So there are many situations that are reported to us that we simply cannot cross-report to law enforcement because of this lack of consent. So two years ago, 
uh, Assemblymember Mariko Nevada uh, was determined to come up with a solution to this problem. Um, initially, in its early form, AB 40 would have changed the mandated reporting requirement from an OR to an AND. By that I mean mandated reporters currently or formerly had the option of reporting to either local law enforcement or the local long-term care ombudsman program. A report to either one of those entities um, would have met your statutory requirements under the mandated reporting laws. Assemblymember Yamada wanted to change that OR to an AND and have mandated reporters report to both. Um, as that bill, AB 40, went through the legislative process, um, the assembly member received a lot of stakeholder input about how to implement those provisions. And the bill was subsequently amended um, to what you see today. And we'll be going through these provisions. It's not simply a, an or to an and change, but one that really tries to take into account um, the nature of the abuse and the agencies that are best equipped to respond to those reports of suspected abuse. We believe that AB 40 is a good step in resolving the problem of disclosure and confidentiality in that it requires reports of physical abuse to go to local law enforcement, the local long-term care ombudsman program, and the respective licensing agency. For residential care facilities, of course, that's community care licensing. These changes went into effect on January 1st of this year, so this is current law now. What do our CFEs need to know? Well, depending on the type of abuse that you're reporting, there are different reporting actions and time frames depending on the type and the severity of abuse. And at this point, I'll turn the webinar over to Sally Michael from CALA, who will talk to us about the reporting provisions that are in AB 40. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Well, today we want to make sure that the providers are, are clear um, on these new requirements. And as Joe mentioned, the, the differences really come down to the, the type of, of suspected or alleged abuse as well as the severity of those. Um, We'll be talking a lot today about physical abuse, um, and a little bit later we'll get into the exact definition of that. But we want to start by running through the, the reporting requirements in different situations. So we're going to start with um, suspected or alleged abuse that results in serious bodily injury. So the change in this situation is that you're going to call local law enforcement immediately, which is defined as within two hours um, of observing or, or obtaining knowledge about this suspected physical abuse. In addition to that, also within that two-hour time frame, you're going to make a written report, which is your SOC 341, um, to your local long-term care ombudsman program. You're going to report that to community care licensing, and you're also going to report that to the local law enforcement agency. So two hours to call local law enforcement and to submit those, uh, that written report to those three parties. Now something that's a little bit different is that community care licensing will be now getting those abuse reports from the mandated reporter as well as the incident reports from the licensee. So you want to make sure that you remember that, that this isn't um, a change in your requirement to do those incident reports. This is over and above that situation. Now in a situation where there is suspected or alleged physical abuse which does not result in serious bodily injury, you still have the same requirements with regard to who you're going to contact and in what fashion. 
The difference is that you have a little bit more time to do that reporting. So again, you're calling local law enforcement and you're submitting the SOC 341 to the Ombudsman, to licensing, and to local law enforcement. But you do have 24 hours to do so. So if, if you're wondering, you know, why the different um, time frames and why serious bodily injury is, is called out when it wasn't really part of the mix before uh, with regard to, to those decision making as, as far as reporting. This really didn't have anything to do um, with the ombudsman pro or problem here in, in California that this bill was attempting to fix. But what had happened in the meantime is that, that federal law had changed regarding um, nursing home abuse reports. And there was an effort to, to make this state law consistent with that standard. Um, as, as an aside, you know, these, these uh, changes are not just for residential care facilities, but for all long-term care providers. So there's some crossover there, and, and um, what, what might work better with in one type of provider may not be the best for all, um, but again, an, an attempt to, uh, to have that consistency across the board. Okay, now we're going to move along to a, a slightly different situation. And Joe talked a little bit about this in, in the overview. Initially, the bill would have required um, reporting to both the long-term care ombudsman and local law enforcement um, in all situations. And one of the things that, that came to light pretty quickly was that there are situations, um, particularly with regard to residents with um, dementia, some common behaviors associated with dementia, you know, pushing, that type of thing, which needs to be reported but, but certainly is um, manif uh, a manifestation of the disease and not intent to abuse anyone. And, and what we wanted to make sure was that we didn't criminalize common de dementia behaviors. The last thing you as a provider would want to have to do is to call a loved one of your resident and say, mom pushed a, another resident and unfortunately I'm going to have to call the police to report that. Calla worked very hard along with a variety of other stakeholders to, to get that part of the bill amended to, to make this more workable. So when you have a situation of physical abuse, that's been caused by a resident with a dementia diagnosis, but there is no serious bodily injury, you have the option of either calling your local long-term care ombudsman program or calling local law enforcement. And you need to do that as soon as practically possible. Then you also need to follow up with your written report, your SOC 341, to whichever entity that you made that, that call to. So I'd like to, to thank all the folks that were involved in helping to get that part of the bill changed to make it certainly um, more workable and, and uh, appropriate for, for our residents with dementia. Okay, so we've talked about um, physical abuse. With regard to suspected or alleged abuse, that is not physical, um, abandonment, abduction, isolation, financial abuse, or neglect, those um, are not changed by AB 40. So you are still going to call either the local long-term care ombudsman or your local law enforcement agency, again, as soon as possible, and you're going to make a written report, again, the SOC 341, um, within two working days. Again, so if it's, if it's not physical abuse, it's the same situation as it has been. So if you're thoroughly confused, <laughs> and we hope you're not, um, in order to ease the confusion and, and really to assist with compliance, um, the, the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program and the association um, work to develop this flow chart and um, on behalf of providers, thank you very much for doing that. Um, 
I think visually it's it's much easier to take a look and and make sure that that you and that the mandated reporters um, in your communities have a really good understanding and a, and a way to make sure that they're taking the appropriate action. This flow chart um, allows you to make a decision as to whether the um, suspected abuse, number one, resulted in serious bodily injury, has no serious bodily injury, or is caused by a resident with dementia diagnosis and no serious bodily injury, and to let you know what the appropriate step is. So you have an opportunity here to personalize this flow chart for your individual communities. We'll encourage you to write in the telephone and the fax numbers um, within your community. And then the, um, the back of the form will have the instructions um, and also the definition of serious bodily injury. This flowchart will be available on the Ombudsman websites, on CALA's website, um, and, and we'll be sending it out to our members through our update. So again, you want to take a look at what is the result of the suspected abuse and looking at the definition of serious bodily injury to, to help you make those appropriate decisions with regard to, to reporting. This is something that involves physical pain, substantial risk of death, loss or impairment of function, requiring met medical intervention which, which might include hospitalization, surgery, or physical rehab. So again, thank you for to the the ombudsman, both the locals and the state program, and in, in putting this program or this flowchart together for us. Lisa's going to step in for a moment and talk a little bit more about the ombudsman role. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of this webinar. Um, as, as a, the executive director for CALCOA, the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association, uh, the association is, is excited to be working with CALA and the state ombudsman to, to work together for the, the betterment of all the residents and, and the care staff and the administrators and the families. Uh, it's a cooperative effort and I'm excited to be a part of this today. The, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman role, uh, the Ombudsman program is a federally mandated program. There is an Ombudsman program in every state, a long-term care Ombudsman program in every state in this country. It is a part of the Older American Act. In California, we have 35 different long-term care Ombudsman programs uh, with a little under 1,000 field Ombudsmen. These field Ombudsmen that come into your communities, they are trained locally, but they are certified by the state Ombudsman. And they do have to follow legal mandates that are required of long-term care ombudsmen. It's not just their preferences. It's not just their personal, um, how they personally view your community. They are following a training that is state mandated. Uh, the role of the long-term care ombudsman in facilities is really three things. We are to investigate, we are to resolve, and we are to educate. So we're excited to be a part of this webinar and the distribution of these flowcharts because that hits one of our three big uh, mandates to educate. And, and I, I'm excited to hear back from the, the facilities and from the ombudsmen that the flowchart is a helpful tool because truly that's what ombudsmen, are, our goal is, is to be helpful. We want to investigate, resolve, educate. We are a resource. Now as far as the AB40, um, it is important for you to understand in a facility that the long-term care ombudsman program, we are required to cross-report as soon as practically possible with law enforcement. It, it's not our job to tattle on a facility. We are required to cross-report. And I think it's important to realize that it's not the ombudsman's role to ever tell a, a local law enforcement not to come in, to not investigate something. That's not my job. Um, uh, what the ombudsman does is we come in and we investigate and we are communicating with our local law enforcement agencies to in, 
to increase effective communication. Uh, I know that the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association and the State Ombudsman Program have been working on uh, memorandums of understanding. They're called MOUs with local law enforcement to create a more efficient cross-reporting. Um, again, it's not the Ombudsman's job to tell a law enforcement officer not to investigate. It is, however, within our scope as Ombudsmen to share with local law, law enforcement our observations, and maybe even our suggestions for resolutions. Um, th these suggestions, they may or may not include the uh, involvement of law enforcement. You know, as an ombudsman, we're, when we're investigating a physical abuse allegation, especially those that are, have residents that have a diagnosis of dementia, it is likely that a better form of resolution is going to be through care planning or staff training or, or many the many other tools that the ombudsmen have available rather than the introduction of a uniformed police officer walking through memory care units. That's not what we're looking to do here. But it is important for facilities to understand that we are to cross-report and we are to provide the most immediate and appropriate response for the resolution of this um, allegation. So that's the Ombudsman's role. I'm going to hand it back to Sally. As you might have guessed, we're juggling headsets, desks, and computers. So thanks for uh, bearing with us. I want to just go back and cover a, a few details. Um, one has to do with your incident reports. Again, uh, licensees are still required to submit an incident report in LIC 624 to community care licensing. Now this is in addition to the um, mandated reporter submitting the 341. There will be no changes to the incident report form itself. So just to, to cover the, the high points again, um, again as Joe mentioned, this bill went into effect January 1. So these are the requirements as of today. Um, if you've not yet taken the, the time to schedule your staff training to make sure that, that uh, all of your staff members are aware of these changes and what their requirements are as mandated reporters, you're going to want to do that really as soon as possible. The SOC 341 is currently under revision by Community Care Licensing. They're anticipating being able to release that new, um, the new form in February. And it will be available on their website, um, the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman site, and the CALA website. Until that revision is done, you can still go ahead and, and use the old one. Unfortunately, the instructions don't comply with the current law, so you're going to have to, to work you know, to, to make sure that it's done correctly, but it is what we um, want, what licensing wants you to use in the interim is the existing form. The other um, situation related to this is the Department of Justice uh, training materials and video that, that you're required to, to show to your employees. Um, due to budget constraints, um, those materials are not going to be changed. And unfortunately, um, some of the information that's in those materials and, and on the video are no longer correct um, as a result of, of AB 40. Um, you are still legally required to show that video. But according to both the Department of Social Services as well as the Department of Justice, you can adjust your curriculum to focus on those new requirements. So certainly we suggest that you augment those materials um, with, with written material and use that flow chart. Um, I think it will be a, a great tool in terms of, of your training as well.
we have a, a list of resources for you um, provided by, by the State of California, the Ombudsman programs, um, community care licensing, um, as well as the Ombudsman Association. Encourage you to keep those links handy. And I'm going to turn this back over to Joe Rodriguez, who will handle any questions that have come up, and encourage you to submit those in writing if you've not yet done so. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Lisa, for your uh, presentations today. Uh, we, we know that um, this new reporting schema is a little bit different and, and can be confusing. And so I, I just wanted to go back again to that mandated reporter flow chart that you see on your screen. And again, this only uh, deals with um, a mandated reporter who observes or has knowledge or reasonably suspects physical abuse that occurs in a long-term care facility. So as, as Sally mentioned earlier, for other types of abuse, your, your current reporting um, scenarios remain in place. You have the option of reporting to either the ombudsman or local law enforcement. So this really only changes um, reports of physical abuse. If it's physical abuse that results in serious bodily injury, you report immediately to local law enforcement and within two hours by written report on the SOC 341 to the ombudsman, law enforcement, and the licensing agency. If there's physical abuse that results that doesn't result in serious bodily injury. Within 24 hours, you report to local law enforcement and by telephone and with, within 24 hours by written report on the SOC 341 to the ombudsman, local law enforcement, and your licensing agency. And finally, if the physical abuse is caused by a resident diagnosed with dementia by a physician and there's no serious bodily injury, you report immediately by phone or as soon as practically possible to the ombudsman or local law enforcement agency and within 24 hours by written report on the SOC 341 form to your local ombudsman or local law enforcement agency. At this time, um, I believe our moderator sent a message out to the group asking if there were questions for us to respond to. Um, some of the questions that we took earlier had to do with specific phone numbers for facilities to use to report to law enforcement. Um, as you can imagine, there, there are multiple hundreds of law enforcement jurisdictions within your state, within our state, and I would encourage you to contact your local law enforcement jurisdiction, whether it's the local police or sheriff, to determine which is the best number um, that you can use to phone in your reports of abuse. The same would go for um, fax numbers. I would encourage you to contact your local law enforcement agency to determine which fax number they would like you to use uh, to report the SOC 341s or to transmit the SOC 341 reports. I, I don't um, know that most agencies will have specific numbers for abuse reporting, but there may be a general number that you can use um, to report to make these reports. Someone also asked if residents who have a diagnosis of dementia um, where there is no serious bodily injury, if those residents would be prosecuted. That's not a, um, unfortunately, that's not a decision that we would make. If, if someone's going to be prosecuted for a crime, that's usually a decision made by the local district attorney, and that doesn't really fall within um, our scope here today. Um, the webinar today is basically to discuss your your role as a mandated reporter. What happens to that report after it's investigated by ombudsman and local law enforcement um, and possibly referred to the district attorney is, is another story. Yes, please. Okay. Um, someone um, asked the question about serious bodily injury. Let's move back to that slide. Um, 
Yes, this, this definition that's in the Welfare and Institutions Code aligns with um, the definition of serious bodily injury that's in the Elder Justice Act. Sally mentioned earlier that some of the changes in our reporting system were aligned to changes in federal law that affect nursing facilities. In the Elder Justice Act, which Congress passed back in March in, of 2010 as a part of the Affordable Care Act, facilities, long-term care facilities that receive $10,000 or more in federal funding have to report to local law enforcement um, any suspicion of a crime that has occurred within their facility. And that includes um, reports of, of abuse that occur in long-term care facilities. The Elder Justice Act um, defined these crimes, and in particular serious bodily injury, as an injury involving extreme physical pain, substantial risk of death, or protracted loss or impairment of function of a bodily member, organ, or of mental faculty, or requiring medical intervention, including but not limited to hospitalization, surgery, or physical rehabilitation. So serious bodily injury is pretty, pretty clearly defined, but what if, I guess, how would you define uh, physical abuse that doesn't result in serious bodily injury? If one of these elements isn't present, or if any of these elements are not present, it wouldn't be serious bodily injury. So in that case, you would still have to report to law enforcement within 24 hours this report of physical abuse, not within, not immediately or, or within two hours, and you would still make your written report to um, the ombudsman and local law enforcement and the licensing agency within 24 hours. Yes, uh, the question is, will CALA send their members the new SOC 341 when it's complete? And Sally indicated earlier that CALA will post the SOC 341 on their website. It will be posted on our website as well, and it will also be on the Department of Social Services website. Um, but but CALA will inform their members when the new form is available. The form, as Sally mentioned, has been revised and is working its way through the Department of Social Services. It's actually being handled by another branch in the Department of Social Services, um, the Adult Services branch, not Community Care Licensing. So it has to go through their vetting process. And we're, we're hopeful that it, it could be ready by February 1st. It may be after that. But I would encourage you that as you, as you complete your your, your report on the existing SOC 341 form that you use this mandated reporter flowchart to help guide you and remind you of where the report needs to be made and when it needs to be made. How does this law affect SNFs? Um, the question was, how does this law affect SNFs? And basically, all of these same provisions um, apply to SNFs. Um, SNFs have already um, had to comply with the federal um, portions of, of this law um, for, um, well, since since the law was passed back in, in March of 2010. So SNFs shouldn't be experiencing any real change in how they report, uh, at least how they've been reporting for the last year or so since the Affordable Care Act went into effect and um, CDPH licensing and certification and CMS um, provided guidance to, to skilled nursing facilities on their reporting guidelines. One of the things that we saw here in AB 40 was an attempt to align state law with these federal mandates. And so we didn't want to have a separate or multiple reporting systems um, that facilities had to comply with in order to, to make sure they were on solid ground uh, and in compliance with the law. So. Assemblymember Yamada tried to conform AB 40 as closely as possible as she could to the Elder Justice Act without providing an additional burden for skilled nursing facilities and not too much of a burden for residential care facilities. And we'll take another question. Okay, this is a general observation, and I think I've already answered this. I found some local law enforcement don't have knowledge of the SOC 341. Will law enforcement receive training as well? Yeah, good question. There was a question about making your reports to law enforcement and law enforcement not having um, a good background on the SOC 341 and what that form is about. Um, 
this law is really going to require a better coordination between local law enforcement and local long-term long care ombudsman programs. To that end, um, we've developed a model memorandum of understanding which was identified earlier for local long-term care ombudsman programs and local law enforcement jurisdictions to determine who or which agency is best equipped to respond to the various types of reports that, that they may be receiving. Um, you know, as, as we said earlier, um, when a resident who has dementia and is unable to willfully intend to commit abuse um, strikes out and hurts another resident, is that is that report better investigated by a local ombudsman program or law enforcement? Um, you know, I think local long-term care ombudsman programs would be better prepared and equipped to deal with a report um, of that nature, a report that, that perhaps is, is signifying these are really behaviors that need to be addressed in an individual resident's care plan rather than by having law enforcement come out to do a, a criminal investigation. If a, if a resident doesn't have the capacity to commit a crime, um, you know, does, does law enforcement need to be involved? Um, certainly if, if there's harm that's been caused by a, a resident or, or to several residents, that's of concern. But for many of these behaviors that don't cause physical harm, we, we think these cases would probably be best handled by a, a local ombudsman. And it is a matter of education. We will be working with local law enforcement to discuss our mutual roles and to determine which agencies would be the best to, to address these, these reports as they come in. Good question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the question is, what is the timeline for the local ombudsman program and for the licensing agency to respond to a report of physical abuse that results in serious bodily injury? Um, I can't speak for the licensing agencies, but I can speak for the ombudsman programs. Um, as we receive these reports, those reports rise to the top of, of our list. and So we will get out on those reports as soon as, as practically possible. Um, in those cases where the reports are, are first being made to local law enforcement with a subsequent written report to the, the local long-term care ombudsman program, um, it, it may be, you know, depending on when the abuse has occurred, if it's occurred, or if the report is made to us in the middle of the night, it, it may not be until the next day or, or the, the morning of the next day uh, before we can get out there. Um, I'm, I'm sure the licensing is going to be just as concerned with with reports that re, that um, that result or that, that are transmitting information that, about residents who experience serious bodily injury, um, and will be out there as soon as they can as well. But I don't know what their timelines are. Um, the question is, does an incident report need to be completed for a resident um, w w who has dementia, um, um, who is the victim of, of a, some sort of um, event? Does that need to be reported as an incident report? And we're suggesting that you contact your LPA to discuss that. Um, this this webinar is is really looking at um, the, the mandated reporting of abuse, not necessarily the incident reports that you also may need to complete. And so, we would encourage you to talk to your LP, to your LPA that's assigned to your community to discuss what community care licensing would like to have. Yes. Uh, the next question is, have facilities been notified of these changes and these reporting requirements? Um, we know that um, community care licensing is still working on their implementation plan 
and they hope to have something about these changes in their adult and senior care program update. Um, I know that the Department of Public Health um, yesterday released an all-facility letter um, that delineates these changes um, for their uh, for their facilities. Um, this webinar is our attempt, along with CALA and CALCOA's attempt, to help educate um, CALA members and others, uh, other mandated reporters and RCFEs, about these changes. Um, so hopefully, information from community care licensing will be forthcoming. The question um, that's been posed is, do, do these new requirements require mandated reporters to bypass their supervisor um, in, reporting, in, in reporting these incidents to ombudsman, law enforcement, and licensing? Um, here in California, the mandated reporter's duty to report is individual. And while you certainly should inform your supervisor of, of anything that you become aware of that you feel you need to report, um, the supervisor should not impede the mandated reporter's responsibility to report. So mandated reporters need to report independent of whatever policies your, your community has in place to address and investigate abuse. Um, so there could be two concurrent uh, investigations going on at the same time, whatever your your facility and your community is doing, as well as what local law enforcement or the ombudsman or licensing is doing. The question is, will this law impact reports of abuse and neglect that come from unwitnessed events, like falls, where, where um, it's unclear how a person has been injured or has, the injury has, has resulted in serious bodily injury? Um, the same provisions would, would, would come into play here. Once the mandated reporter becomes aware of, of a resident who has experienced serious bodily injury, if they suspect that it's abuse, physical abuse, um, if they're unsure, I would say to be safe, report it per the guide, per the timelines that are in AB 40, um, and let those determinations about what actually happened uh, be made after the report is, is investigated. I think just to play it safe, you might want to go ahead and report. Yes, the, the question is, can the flowchart be used by mandated reporters in both SNFs and RCFEs? And the answer to that is yes. These reporting requirements apply to both facility types. And um, the mandated re reporter flowchart was sent out yesterday to all registered attendees for this webinar. It will be on the CALA website. It will be on the CALCOA website and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program website. So if you... Yes, and our 35 local ombudsman programs um, have about 11,000 copies of this mandated flowchart that they will be distributing to your facilities as well. So um, ask your local ombudsman program or go to the CALA website or the CALCOA website to download a, a copy of the mandated flowchart, mandated reporter flowchart. And I think that's the last question. Are there any other questions that uh, our participants have? You can type those into the question box there on, in the GoToMeeting application. OK. Well, again, um, I wanted to bring up this last screen about state resources that are available um, for a listing of the local long-term care ombudsman programs in your community. You can go to our website, www.aging.ca.gov, and navigate to the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Um, 
you can also call the toll-free statewide Ombudsman Crisis Line at 1-800-231-4024. And we can answer any questions that you have about mandated reporting responsibilities. You can also go to the Community Care Licensing website, ccld.ca.gov, the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association, CALCOA, CLTCOA, <coughs> excuse me, .org, or again, the um, CALA website, CALA, C-A-L-A dot org. I'm sorry, C-A assisted living dot org. And we have one more question. The question is, how does the law apply to other licensed facilities? Um, the law applies to all long-term care facilities, long-term health care facilities, and community care facilities that are defined as long-term care facilities in state law. So for, um, for the facilities licensed by the California Department of Public Health, those facilities would be adult day health centers, congregate living health facilities, the intermediate care facilities, um, and the intermediate care facilities for the developmentally disabled, uh, developmentally disabled continuous nursing, developmentally disabled habilitative, developmentally disabled nursing, and skilled nursing facilities. For the community care facilities, of course, it would be residential care facilities for the elderly, adult residential facilities, and adult day programs. Those are all of the facility types that are covered by AB 40. The question uh, was, does the incident report need to go to the ombudsman as well as community care licensing? It does not need to go to the ombudsman. If you want to share it with the ombudsman, you can, but you're not required to. And I think that was our last question. So again, um, thanks to Sally Michael with CALA. Thanks to Lisa Coleman with the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. And thanks to all of you who joined us for this webinar today. Again, if you have further questions, you can contact CALA, you can contact your local ombudsman, or community care licensing, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks again for joining us today on this webinar, and this concludes our webinar for this afternoon. Thank you, and have a good rest of the day.